There you are. How's it going? Hey, how's it going with you? Great, you look beautiful. Oh, you're so sweet. So do you. Oh, well, you know, that's just how God made me. I know. I know. You're adorable. <laughs> um, and I love you against the blue. Thanks. Yeah, this is my studio. Uh, I guess that's your studio? Yep, yeah. Let me see what I can see here. Uh, you see, I think you'll recognize the Jack Davis Frankenstein on the door. Yeah, nice. Uh, I have a skeleton that's just like, I have two skeletons on my altar. Uh, well, one just is down now. I think he felt wait. This is not a skeleton, but I have that guy. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, he's okay. Uh, that's my book in progress on top of the see, cabinet. Oh my gosh, I've been seeing, I've been seeing the yeah. updates. Yeah, yeah, so. You're amazing. You're a cartoonist cartoonist. Yeah, unfortunately. No. It's wonderful. I'm not, I'm not the people's champion. I'm the oh, cartoonist champion. Just wait, my friend. Just wait. Just wait. <laughs> Your last book was wonderful. Oh, thank you. I, um, I love it. Well, so was yours, which is this one right here. This is your last book. <laughs> I guess so. I guess so. Yeah. You won an Eisner Award for a free comic book day comic. That's got to feel good, right? That's crazy. That's really crazy. That's amazing. That's, you know who? You know who we can blame for that is Eric Reynolds. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He's, a, he's at fault for that. He's one of the greatest editors in comics, right? He's fantastic. I love him. Is your studio uh, separate from your house, or your home, or yep. how do you? It's like an old dilapidated place on the outside, but on the inside, it's really cool. Yeah. Um, it's a little dilap dilapidated on the inside, but I like it. Mm -hmm. The heat, I'm wearing this coat because the heat is not good here. Oh, it's okay. Horrible. So uh, I sleep on a blow up bed in here mm -hmm. during quarantine and I yeah. love it. I'm camping. Yeah. I have a little hot plate that I make all my food on. Because like an artist studio was always uh, sort of like stepping inside of their brain where they just hang up interesting things to them and stuff like that. Yeah, I know. That's why when I, I was like, I'm going to get to see Noah's studio. Oh, it's just, it's so boring though. Like I, oh. I, I you know, uh, I just like, I tack up stuff on this board here. So like, if I'm like in the New Yorker, uh, looking at the New Yorker magazine, there'll be like a, there's like a Rotu Modan drawing that she did that I just pinned up there. Oh and yeah, that, she's I'm, great. I really love those like Victorian, um, where it's just like these like fashion drawings. I'll show you one that I have right here behind my computer. Hang it up. Where it's just like women in like dresses. I so I have like uh, tons of- I these. collected those as a kid. No kidding. Oh, you're, you're insane and I love you for that. I collected those as a kid and I learned all the names for, you know, you know, decolletage, mm, yeah. uh, all the names for clothing. I, I was very, my grandfather was a furrier and a dressmaker. And uh, he made clothes for uh, Al Capone's, you know, wife and mall. And, uh, you know, he suited up a lot of famous people. Um, wow. Yeah. So he, you know, there was this whole love in my family of, not that I dress well or anything, I don't, but, you know, I still love clothes. What do you think about, what, what does that do for you visually? Um, you know, it's just a creepy remnant of the past. I, that's the thing that I have is like, I, and I think a lot of artists do. When I go to cities, I just, I'm doing, um, what's it called? Archaeology. Like I, I'm walking around, I'm looking for pieces of the past that are, that are sticking out somewhere, you know, uh, like a drop tile ceiling, in like an old building. Yeah, me too. You just know that right above that is like the good stuff. That's the old parts yeah. of the building you want to see. The old pressed copper ceiling, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, um, I would walk through <laughs> alleyways because alleyways they would leave alone. They would, they would always update the stuff that faced the streets. So you walk through the alleyways and you'll see like a bit of an old advertisement painted on a brick wall, you know, old plumbing, maybe a little bit of the asphalt receded and you see like the old brick road that they had there at one time. Stuff like I, that. I'm that same, yeah. I hound this. Uh, not far from here, somebody tore off a facade and there was these old 1920s dry cleaners, a dry cleaner sign revealed. Oh. And I, I just, I had to take pictures of it because it was so great. Yeah. Um, and then they just paint over it or whatever. Yeah. And it's, it's nothing. But yeah. I think maybe artists, they always like notice those kinds of things. And, uh, you know, it was difficult because I was living in Denver for so long. And Denver is only really goes back to the 1890s, which isn't really old enough for me. 
So <laughs> like living down here in the South, it's way more artistically stimulating because God, it's ancient around here. I mean, there's really- What city are you in again? I'm in Columbia. There's something to the South that's pretty interesting. I mean, yeah. I think it's haunted as hell. Oh yeah. Uh, have you had any experiences yet? Well, I, I haven't had any experiences, but I feel since I've got down since I've gotten down here, I, I felt like there's like a psychic heaviness to the South. And you can just tell a lot of bad stuff has happened here. A lot of emotions have been spilled out. It's very heavy. And um, even in our neighborhood here, a couple blocks away is an old Confederate cemetery. just tucked away in the middle of our neighborhood. And then outside of that little section, if you look into the trees, there are more headstones. They're just kind of sticking up, buried by branches and vines and things. Wow. And it's just like, it's a park now, you know? But it's like there's dead bodies. All that we're just walking on top of and and the ground sinks in where you can see, you know, that's how you know that there's a casket down there. It's like an unmarked. It's pretty great. I, th I think as artists, we, <clears throat> we intuit, we know, intuit, um, sense stories, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? And that's why these things matter to us. And I think stories are connected to ghosts, you know, because ghosts are stories and stories are ghosts, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, Chicago, I mean, are you a lifelong Chicagoan? I figured you were. No, uh, I was born in Chicago here, and then I moved to uh, New Mexico with my uh, with my parents because uh, I don't know why the hell they did that, but they did. Hmm. And uh, in northern New Mexico, which is where my mother was from, and uh, I lived uh, in Santa Fe. I lived in Albuquerque and Santa Fe with my grandparents a lot, and uh, they were really great. And uh, I loved New Mexico. But uh, I came here when I was about five years old. I came back. I was here until I was, uh, I was here on the south side, because um, that's where I was born. And I lived there until I was about one or two. When my parents got divorced, my dad moved to New Mexico, so. Where in? Sorry, uh, Hemet Springs. Really? Yeah, yeah, so um, I would have to go there all the time. And it was just basically like a hippie community, it was very small. Oh. Uh, he like worked at a restaurant called The Laughing Lizard. He was a dishwasher there. That's the perfect name for a hippie restaurant. <laughs> yeah, and we were. Like he lived in this like weird compound where like it, they didn't have a bathroom. They had like a big oil drum with a toilet seat on it. And uh, and I was a teenager at the time, so I was just very embarrassed by all this stuff. And uh, yeah. And um, then we go out hiking and and fossil hunting in New Mexico, just out in the middle of nowhere in the desert and stuff. Yeah, which is cool. Yeah, so I, I really like New Mexico. I think it's a beautiful state. But it's kind of a place you go to uh, when, you, when, when you've when you messed up in life and you're just like, let me just go out to the desert and just live among other people that have messed up. And just I like that idea of places we can go when we've messed up, you know? Yeah, well, that's what's great about the United States, right? There's like plenty of, <laughs> there's plenty of places like that. I mean, that's the history of the West, isn't it? I mean, it seems like- It's true. Messed up, yeah. It's true. Way. I have an ancestor who uh, was a horse thief and uh, he had come from Ireland and he uh, was, you know, I think a lot of people did this, you know, there's the Four Corners area of New Northern New Mexico, or not Northern, Four Corners, New Mexico. And he was buying horses from Colorado and selling them in New Mexico. You know, he was, he was, he was doing bad things or stealing horses, not buying. And uh, he got caught, but because he was well educated, um, he escaped and I'm sure they let him off because he was Irish and, you know, white and uh, mm -hmm. they didn't hang him. And he went to Texas and became a judge, <laughs> which I mean, it's like only in Texas, right? I mean, yeah. I mean, only in the Southwest, actually. The whole place is exactly what you're saying. It's about, you know, kind of getting cover for, for your sh shit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's a lot of stories like that, I'm sure. People who like murdered somebody in New York and then they just headed west. <laughs> yeah. yeah, and I think I like the idea. I, mm -hmm. I, wonder, I wonder if it changes your national character, if there is a place you can go. Whereas I think of, you know, the French and there's, maybe there's a place, but I doubt it. You know, because I think even in the provincial areas of France, everybody's gonna figure out who you are. Yeah. And it's not that big a country, so people are going to talk, you know? Yeah. You love France, don't you? I do. You I completely love it. 
Yeah, I saw you there at Angoulême. You were there? Yeah, I, in fact, there's a photo of us together at Angoulême. <laughs> I was, you know, I was so sick. At oh, okay. I, I was desperately ill. I, I think I had pneumonia, but I wouldn't stop. And um, I was so sick for weeks after that. I don't remember a lot of it. Isn't that oh. terrible? You're telling me something I didn't know. Oh, I didn't yeah. know we took a picture together. I was so out of it. I was on so much drug on so many, you know, things just to stay up. Wow. Mm. Yeah, I was really not well. When did it happen? When you were you sick on the plane, or was it when you got to? I got sick right after I got there, and I think there's something. I caught something on the plane. It felt like. Uh oh. And uh, I just wasn't well. And at all. But you were doing the. Is this for the museum thing that you were doing there, like at the Louvre? No, that was later. Oh, okay. The museum thing happened later. Yeah. I got sick then too. I, I'm sorry to say I, I do that a lot now. Yeah, we'll stay in. I had the real bad. I had a real bad virus, and uh, you know that. I think we're realizing how bad the lifespan of viral infection is not short. It's really long. Yeah, yeah. You know, so you like I, France? I, I love it. I love it so much. In fact, I feel more um, at home artistically there than I do in America. I sad to say, but I do too. Mm -hmm. It's because the French really, they love art and they love stories. They mm -hmm. really do. Yeah. And I, I don't, it's so strange. How could they be so different than we are in the United States in some ways? Um, I was, I, I want to ask you about, you never went to art school growing up, right? I didn't go until I was 40 years old and paralyzed. So it was um, yeah. a challenge at that point. So I guess knowing about, about you, what I do, your dad was a toy designer, right? Did he get you into that? Toy design? Yeah, because you did yeah. stuff for McDonald's and things. Yeah, he did. It was him. It was all him. What kind of stuff was he doing? Oh my gosh, he did uh, a lot of great stuff that I'm proud of. You know, uh, he did a lot of board games, like mm -hmm. Masterpiece was one of his board games and Dealer's Choice, which was uh, interesting. And then there was an electoral college game that I made me so angry as a kid because I was, when I first played it, I was like, this is so unfair. What is this electoral college? It's like, they're going to pick our president. And I remember having this argument with my next door neighbor, Adam Burke. His father was also a toy designer and worked at the same company. And... Um, he was like defending the system because he ended up, you know, becoming very successful because he understands systems. And I was like, this is bad. And I don't feel like I, you know, I mean, I was just off. I went off on the whole thing, but um, that aside, uh, my father designed the Mickey Mouse phone and um, oh. he had, he, in, I, I'm not clear to this day, but I know that he did, Simon, the the lights game, he oh. did uh, had some impact in that. And hungry, hungry hippos. I think he did had some, either it was all his or part his. And um, there were others, you know, like the honeymooners game. And I don't know. I could go on. How do you do that? Do you is, you are you sculpting these toys out of like clay or something? How is that done? Well, ultimately, yeah. Ultimately, I don't know if you ever saw the Inspector Gadget. You know, they had that whole toy that had all the parts and you collected them. From sure. McDonald's. He did that. That was all his. Oh. Um, he was really a great sculptor. He was a sculptor, a graphic artist and a sculptor. And um, he, you know, got me sculpting when I was really young. Uh, so a lot of those things were sculpted at that time. Now everything's 3D, I would imagine. And um, there's probably not as much need for sculptors as there once was. Yeah, you would do it on a, on a computer, I guess, huh? And then... Yeah, I would imagine. 3D printed. As, as eventually we will do many things. Yeah. I was looking at an AI made art. Have you seen that? No, I haven't. Is it good? Oh, it's really disturbing. And I know, I mean, I'm talking, and right now the computer's right here and I'm talking about it. It's like I'm telling on it. I'm <laughs> telling on the AI. Um, it's like, you gotta, I'll try to find some and send it to you. Yeah. Okay, you know how when you've got people, for instance, like Picasso, who skews the proportions of the face in an interesting way, mm -hmm. the computer does the same thing because I guess it's figured out we like that. But the way it does it makes everybody 
you know, the pretty woman, the gypsy, you know, I mean, very inappropriately, it's gotten a lot of our tropes that are not right. And, you know, but it skews the facial features like serial killers. Oh. And it, um, I'll show you, it's really disturbing and kind of great because yeah. I would be able to pick out AI art anywhere. That's good though. That's good. Yeah, no, it's really good. I wonder. We, we probably shouldn't tell it that it doesn't. That it's, we probably should just be like, "You did it! It's perfect." And for what purpose? And would people be interested in that? Like computer-made art. I think if your if your mindset is let's make toilet plungers, then art is just a product, and yeah. you probably don't think of it as anything. I mean that that's sort of an outgrowth of our a culture that's really invested in the kind of materialistic aspects of science mm. you know that and and you have people who well I, I think it was it was Jim Carrey Jim Carrey said something I really liked he said um I used to think I was um a man having an experience in the universe but then I realized I was the universe having an experience in a man uh -huh. and I know that sounds like completely mind-blowing but if you take the idea that you're much bigger than the confines of your body Mm -hmm. um, then material science, as we understand it, is missing this aspect of our capacity to go beyond our limitations. Mm -hmm. And uh, that says interesting things to us. Mm -hmm. That's a lot to think about. <laughs> but if, the, if we don't believe that, and we believe that, you know, there's just toilet plungers and, and bricks and things that you can create, and art is just one of those, then uh, you get AI, you know, making serial killers for art, which I think is great. When I got money, the first time I sold the book, which was to uh, a, not, not to Fanographics, it was somebody else. And um, I, I got a little dump of money and I took the money and went on eBay and bought back all my um, eeries and creepies and weirds and all the things that, you know, had gotten thrown out, um, you know, like you always, Somebody's mother always throws your stuff out, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I was thrilled. Like I was reading them and uh, I was completely engaged. It was, yeah. and I realized, you know, how stupid I was in some ways. And also they were not stupid at all. It was both. It was like, there's a naivete to it all, but there was also great art and really kind of interesting stories in some of them. So did you read like famous monsters of filmland stuff? Like oh that? yeah. And then you've just been buying back. Well, that's been so buying cool. them back. That is so cool. Yeah, isn't that interesting? That's such a gift that you can just get back in touch with your youth in that way. Uh, just yeah. Through these things, you know. I I, yeah. I um my mom sent me a box of stuff that was at her house, and in there was this, like, grocery store Star Wars magazine. For in like that came out in 1997. Oh wow! I, I held on to for some reason. I coveted it as a child. I remember pouring over this magazine had photos of like the making of Star Wars. It was all from the 1970s stuff, you know, and the uh, the photos of the early Star Wars toys and stuff. And I was just a little kid looking at this. I I just like these things were like sacred objects to me. Like look at that. Oh my god! I, I wish I could have that. This magazine meant so much. So, so then I just kind of forgot about it. And my mom sent me a box of stuff and it was in there. And I was like, oh my God. And it's all worn out and stuff because I just carried it in my book bag all the time. And I was just looking at it again as an adult. And it's like, I remember every, all those images are seared into my brain. It's so interesting. It's just like immediately like, oh yeah, that's, ah, I remember, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. And it, yeah I, immediately I was like a little kid in Arizona. Oh. Like just immediately. We're in Arizona. Uh, Mesa, Arizona. Is where I Mesa. Yeah. yeah. You know, I'm trying to work up a, so I'm coming towards the end of the book I've been working on. So now I'm thinking about what am I going to do next? And I kind of want to do a, a YA graphic novel about my own childhood and the imagination that I had. I think you've got to. Yeah. I mean, that living in the commune thing, that alone, mm -hmm. <laughs> the laughing lizard and the, oh, yeah. the, the drum toilet. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's all fantastic. I had a little toy triceratops that I carried with me everywhere. That was a, uh, my best friend, his name was Mellow Mutt. Mm. And it was so, I, all my friends that I met in school all caught on to what I was doing with this little imaginary friend I had. 
and then everybody, <laughs> all the kids like in the school had their own little friend dinosaur. It was just they all got caught on and, and copied me. <laughs> That's great. What did you, what was his name? Mellow Mutt, which was a name I took from Scooby-Doo. Yeah. Uh, yeah, Sco when Scooby-Doo was a superhero, they called him Mellow Mutt. I just thought that was funny. So I named my toy dinosaur that. Now, do you still have him? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. In fact, I have several because I, I tracked them down on eBay and rebought them. Can I them. see him? This was Mellow Mutt, the original. It was a little Jurassic Park. He's adorable. From 1993. Oh, he's and adorable. They took the same mold and they remade it in like the next series and just give it a different color job. I like the colors though. Yeah, Ooh. so that's the that's second true. version of Mellow Mutt. He's got the largest eyes for a dinosaur. <laughs> Pretty impressive eyes. <laughs> I have dinosaur sculptures and, and doll toys here that I Oh have. really? Yeah, um, I kind of like love them. If I find like, them in the thrift shop, I buy them. I'm trying to see. I mean, I could get some for you if you want to yeah, see. Yeah, yeah, a good one. Okay, I'll get you one. Yeah. Here's the dinosaur. I find uh, there's many. I just got you one. Oh, and yeah, this is his nice. friend, the angel. They're together. They're like really tight. Um, <laughs> And then I have this guy who I just really like. Oh, I love uh, that. Isn't he great? I love him. See, I have this whole row of like Madonnas and dinosaurs. They're all together. Then I just had this guy. I know he's a special character. I don't I like know whose that. head it is, but I liked his head. You know, you just find stuff like that for 10 cents. And I, I invariably buy it because oh, I'm yeah. paying. I would too. So, yeah, you too? I, oh yeah, like I love those when you go to a little corner store and they'll have just like a bag full of little plastic dinosaurs. Oh yeah. I'm like, all right, I gotta, I gotta buy this stuff. And I don't I even have, know what I'm gonna do with it, but. I have bags of dinosaurs. <laughs> I do. I actually have a storage locker that is too full of things like that. It's crazy. But um, when I, you know, because I'm doing Mama's Altar, I'm making mm -hmm. Mama's Altar. And because I'm making, um, uh, the clowns, the clown collection. Yeah. Uh, it's not, that's just a tiny part of the count clown collection. The clown collection is probably close to 300 clowns at this point. Um, and that's for one of the characters in forthcoming material. Okay. So, yeah. What, what questions are you sick of being asked about, um, I guess, when it comes to your book? Is there, are people, like my favorite thing is monsters, like, because you've done so many interviews. The nice part of uh, doing this is that well, there's so many nice parts so that, you know, when people ask you questions, one of the things I realized, Noah, because that was happening a lot, is that people don't really come to see you. Mm. I mean, in a way they do, but truthfully, they're kind of coming to see the part of you, the aspect of them that is you. Oh, interesting. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, like, so they, what they like about your work is what they see them... They, what they recognize of themselves in it or something, right? I think, I think there's some truth to that. And I think that if they ask you a question, sometimes it's because they're actually asking themselves that question and you're the stand-in who has to answer for them. Huh. So I don't feel like I'm answering everybody's question over and over again. I feel like I'm answering a question to one person. Sometimes it's just that it's the first and only question they can think of you know, and they want to talk to you. So they ask you that question. So the interaction isn't really about you answering that question. The interaction is really about you seeing them. Because, mm. you know, we don't get seen enough in life. It's a big crime of how we educate people that we teach people to accept not being seen. And so they choose a life of kind of, um, of not really putting themselves in the world in a way that's authentic because we make people think, well, that's going to be rejected, mm -hmm. you know, and, and then you meet somebody who you, maybe you admire for some reason. And it's really important that that's a good experience, you know? Yeah. Well, I've noticed that about how you, cause I've signed next to you several times where I never got a chance to say hi to you because you focus directly. It's like tunnel vision on whoever you're signing a book for and talking to. Um, and that's pretty amazing that you give them that much. Well, it means something. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? I came out, I came out of um, 
kind of a bad place, you know, when I came out of being paralyzed and, and um, really poor, <laughs> like crazily poor. Uh, when I had my daughter, I was a single parent. And I mean, we had nothing. We were just so poor. And uh, I mean, we didn't even own a, I couldn't even afford a phone, a telephone, you know. Mm. I mean, I was on that level. We ate at a pantry. We got our food from a food pantry and uh, we struggled. And now it's all a gift. Like all of this that's happened to me, it's all just a crazy gift. Mm. You know, it's like a, it's like, um, I almost can't even believe it. Sometimes I just don't know what to think about it all. But I know one thing, and that is that um, the kindness and the openness people have shown my book, I'm grateful for. And yeah. when they come to see me, it's a momentous occasion for me, and I hope for them. You know, so uh, I don't take it lightly, and it's not something I get over my own shyness because I want to honor that that interaction mm -hmm. and this scarf this scarf was made for me by this wonderful woman named martine who um it's just like my greatest award you know i've mm -hmm. gotten a lot of awards but this is the nicest thing that i think i've ever gotten and uh or among them and it's because she was uh reading my book when she was caring for her mother in the hospital as she died and you would not think that my book would be a book you would want to climb into if you were going through that, right? But she said it was a tremendous relief for her to not be in her own life. And I think that's what we offer people, mm -hmm. this capacity to jump that groove into another life. And it's a relief, you know, it's just a tremendous relief. And um, so I treasure this, you know, because um, I know it's made what it's made out of, you know, and it's human and beautiful. Oh, that's great. Yeah. How, how uh, long did it take you to, to do that book? And was it actually drawn in notebooks? I always wonder about that. I, I kind of don't know because there was a lot of the book that I, you know, a lot of pages I just, uh, I didn't like. Mm -hmm. So I didn't use them. Um, so, I mean, I don't know um, really exactly. I'd have to really, I should sit down someday. I think it was like four years around there, something like that. Um, and I started out drawing on notebook paper. And Noah, you will understand this in a way that probably most people won't. If you draw on notebook paper, you're damned because you can never correct anything, you know? <laughs> You're damned. I mean, those blue lines are, are a prison and you will go to prison um, because you can't, you can't change a drawing. You can't change, you can't, you know, remove text for translation. Mm -hmm. um, you can't enlarge a word balloon when you realize something has to be explained that wasn't explained. Uh, so um, I did it. And I started it that way. And so I have some original drawings that are all on notebook paper. And then I realized, no, this is bad. This is really bad. So yeah. was that Jacob Covey who put that together to make it? Uh, all oh, I'd already figured it out. Oh, I'd, okay. already it out. I'd already been doing it the way that I did it. Um, uh, he just, he made the version of the notebook, the background cleaner. Um, but it already existed and it was already, you know, I already had a system. So. Yeah. And you, how hard was it? Cause you had an agent for this book, didn't you? I did. And you were coming out as like an author that nobody knew. And then you had to try and find an agent. That must've been impossible. No, it, it was really fast. It happened kind of fast, but um, one of the things I learned about, uh, the process is that you have to want the story to come out more than anybody else. Mm. And you have to keep wanting that because there are so many things that will discourage you. Um, and I call it survival arrogance. And um, 
it's like where I used to get um, rejected for um, exhibitions all the time. And what I would do when I got my rejection letter is I would write a quote from the person who rejected me when they realized how famous I was and that they had rejected me. And the quote would usually go, damn it, did I really just reject her? Look where she is now. Oh man, you know, I would write the whole thing out. Yeah. And I mean, I know that sounds kind of petty in a way, but um, it, felt, it felt just like great. And then I just kept deciding, and that's survival arrogance. I just kept deciding to believe that that was going to happen. The people who had always said, take a hike, you know, I was going to have that day. Is that self-actualization? I guess it, it, it really has been mm-hmm. because it's happened. Yeah. Practically word for similar. word. What? I did something similar to that, okay. which I, I'm a little embarrassed about. Uh, when I got my first story published in Moam, which was, everybody knows at this point, was like the biggest struggle of my artistic life to get something published in Moam by Fanographics. Eric wrote to me and said, hey, I need a bio for your comic in this issue. And I knew that the general public wouldn't know that the artists were the ones writing their bio. I thought they brought, they're going to look at this and think this is what Fanographics said. So I wrote a bio that was like, Noah Van Skyver is absolutely promising as an artist. And I, I gave it, and Eric just, he published it. And I thought, because that's it. what I wanted, that's what I wanted Eric to, to think of me. That's what I wanted Fanographics to feel about me. And that's what I wanted people reading my comics to think of me. It's like, this guy is someone we need to follow or whatever. So that's what I made them publish in the anthology. <laughs> I'm just going to put this I out think there. That's exactly what, you know, I'm really for this survival arrogance. I, I think it has to be. And I, I did, I shouldn't admit this too, but I have to have to go with you in the confession world and admit that um, I published something in, uh, I can't even, I think it, it was a poetry magazine called Make. Hmm. And um, I wrote that, you know, Emile's forthcoming graphic novel. And I didn't have a graphic novel or a publisher or like anything. Like even, I didn't even have an outline of a graphic novel. I just decided that's what I was gonna do. And when they asked for a bio, I was like, I know everybody's bio is gonna be great. And mine's just gonna be, I'm a person, I did something, you know, it's just not gonna be good at all. Mm -hmm. And so I did the same thing. I was just like, I didn't say lauded or, you know, I didn't didn't cheese it up, but I just made it up. And my daughter was really disturbed by it at the time. And if, I think she was really like 12 or something. And I, I was like, man, you're teaching your kid to totally lie. And, uh, I, and I was like, you know what? You just have, to, just have to believe in yourself so much. And I also said this other thing that was crazy, as many things I say are. And that is, well, it isn't a lie if, if I'm writing this in five years. So I'm just going to say that this is something I'm writing from five years from now. Mm-hmm which is crazy. <laughs> um, but, you know. Yeah. And, well, and, like you, did it, and it, it, you did it too. Yeah, well, they say fake it till you make it, right? And, that, and I think that actually works sometimes. You just, you just uh, kind of put this whole thing out there to the world that you're a successful graphic novelist or whatever, that you're like a great cartoonist that everybody should be keeping an eye on. And people kind of, even if they don't believe it, they're suddenly paying attention to you because they're like, who is this person <laughs> think they are? Why are they saying, you know, it works right. either way. <laughs> no, I, I like that. And I think more people, and I, I noticed that especially women don't feel, you know, they feel like they're imposters. And mm-hmm. I just, I think everybody feels like an imposter really, because we all are actually imposters, you know? Mm-hmm. I mean, I think because I believe in reincarnation, I think we were all somebody else in our last life, and that's part of the reason we feel like it. It's like a, if, if there wasn't like a heaven or hell or anything, I think that'd be fine too. Like I, I might be okay with just dying, and then that's it. That's you know, that's the end. But energy never, uh, energy becomes something else. Mm-hmm. You know, nothing goes into non-existence. Hmm. That's a scientific principle, right? 
That's terrifying. <laughs> yeah, isn't it? It's kind of cool though, if you think about it. I mean, the one thing I don't want to do is forget this life because this last few years have been great. Yeah. So I kind of think, well, if I have to go, I want to carry forward that knowledge about this stuff. Like, I don't want to forget who I am right now. Yeah. But the fact that if it's true, we've all forgotten who we are so many times. Isn't that weird? It is weird. Yeah. yeah. I, I've been lucky that anything I desperately wanted has happened for me. What I really wanted all throughout my 20s, I, I think about my 20s as like this time period where I was like lost in the woods. Like I, I was just out in the wilderness and I, I wanted a family to belong to, but I didn't have one. Christmases, I was the third wheel. If I was anywhere, I was at somebody else's Christmas. I oh. didn't have a, a partner. I, I wanted to be a husband really bad in my 20s, and I could not get that together. I could not figure it out. You found uh, the best woman, too. Yeah, she's great. <laughs> she's and, beautiful and intelligent and yeah, and artistic funny. And, and just like, she's incredible. You guys are a great couple. Yeah, I, I, don't, I, I mean, I don't know how that person was delivered to me in my life. It's interesting. Well, because you're a good guy, and she, she can yeah. see it. But just and then the parts me, of you that aren't good, that's the kind of woman you want. Because she'll be like, that's, that's out. You're not doing oh, that. Yeah. We, we talked about that. In fact, I, we talked about that the other day. It's like, she has so much like empathy and caring and stuff. And I, because I grew up in, in a household that was just full of maniacs and we we're just desperately poor as well and stuff. I developed a very selfish kind of, but what about me kind of immediate reaction to things. And she doesn't have that at all. And I really feel like being with her has uh, been such you a lesson up. for me. Uh, I missed that because you broke up. You, oh, okay. you broke for a moment. Oh, she uh, said, uh, she doesn't have that. And then I didn't get anything. Yeah, yeah. Well, she, she doesn't have that. And so that's been um, a lesson for me in, in kind of breaking that and, and thinking about others before myself and just kind of rewiring my own brain because of the survivalist mechanism that I built up growing up in that way, you know, where it's just like the groceries come into the household. I better hoard as much as I can because I'm not going to get anything otherwise, you know? Yeah. It's a weird thing. So, and I still feel that way. I still feel like, you know, I, I don't know, like, I, and, and now more than ever, of course, you need to think like that. You need to, to be empathetic and think about other people before yourself. So for example, we were at a, a restaurant the other day and there was this woman in the parking lot crying, holding a baby. In a, outside of her car and my I was just like I don't want to get mixed up in whatever that is and Amy immediately went over and made sure that she was okay and uh went into the restaurant and got her food and gave her money and we drove with the woman over to a gas station so she would build her truck and stuff and I was just like I can't believe I didn't even think about that I thought immediately my reaction was I, I got my own troubles I don't want these troubles in my life you know and I felt so deeply ashamed about that and that Amy's immediate reaction is this person is hurting, I need to help them, you know? So she's a really good teacher for me in that way. And I but feel you know, like- Noah, I yeah. think it's beautiful that you just said that. I think it's incredibly beautiful that you just said that. How many people are you giving a path to by saying, I have someone in my life who's teaching me, who's helping me evolve. Mm -hmm. That's an amazing, vulnerable, beautiful admission about who you are and who you've decided to be because you want this woman in your life who will teach you. And, you know, the truth is she is privileged enough not to have had to go through what you went through. She was able to learn other things and now she can teach those to you, but don't forget that. And I'm not saying this to be rude to you, but I also experienced poverty as a child. Mm -hmm. And uh, once my father got a good job, it changed. But prior to that, we were, excruciatingly poor um and what i would say to you is those survival abilities you have are nothing to be sneezed at especially in a climate where the economy is looking very uncertain your mm -hmm. capacity to turn to, you know to um turn flax to gold uh and to make do and to be cunning and to you know know how to get the two of you i mean if for some reason you had to do something mammoth like cross the border into canada god willing you don't um you'd be the guy to be with 
because you'd be the guy who would figure out how to do that, you and Amy, without either of you dying. Yeah. And, you know, it's good. It's good. It's good. You know, you've got skills and they're just, I get that. I, I think it's a, amazing, though, that uh, you're that open to learning a different thing. That's Thank you. beautiful. Human beings are magicians. And that's what all of history is trying not to teach us. I mean, I know that sounds like a conspiracy thing, but I don't mean it that way. Or maybe I do. I don't know. Um, I don't think we're supposed to know how powerful we are. I think that's what, um, so, the, you know, look at the 60s, you know. Um, and that's why I paralleled these two periods in time, Weimar, Germany, and, and the 1960s. And I think right now we're looking at another parallel time. And these are times when um, you have the young, you know, because of the First World War and the death, and then because of the baby boom generation, and now you have the young, really, they just changed this election. They voted in massive numbers. And, and the thing is, when you have the young, and when the young are open and uh, evolving and awake and engaged, there's a certain element of our society that gets very anxious because systems of control cannot be propped up in that environment. And so I think it's just like, well, why, what are they afraid of? And they're afraid of like kind of what you just said, which is they're afraid of us actually connecting the way you've connected to Amy for your spiritual evolution, the way we connect to each other for all of our spiritual evolution, the way we help each other, the way we, um, the way we are recognizing that we are actually all connected, really connected. You know, we have this great tool now that is a metaphor for the way we're connected even without it. Because how many times have you thought about somebody and they call in a day or, or, or so, you know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah, that, yeah. And they've, they've said that this is not just, a, a, this is a statistical anomaly if you think it's something that isn't, it's a human thing. It's something that we can do. This ability to know when you're being watched, which actually is scientifically proven. People will know when they're being watched. How? Yeah. yeah that's How? True. Because we're all connected, you know? And um, it's about to be really mind blowing. I mean, it's about to get super mind blowing. Like, you know why? Because in, in about a half an hour, you're going to leave that room, you're going to open the closet door, and I'm going to be there. <laughs> <laughs> and that's going to fuck you up. You know? <laughs> yeah. so, let, let me ask you a little bit more about um, my favorite thing is monsters, because when you started writing it, was that after you, because you took a writing class at the college? Is that what happened? And then... No, I I, uh, I was in a wheelchair and I was like, what do I do? I can't use my right hand anymore. Um, I can't walk. I have brain damage. I couldn't talk very well. Um, hmm. So I was like, what the hell am I going to do? I was cleaning houses uh, to keep my daughter alive. And we were living, we lived in a kind of a housing project run by a church. It was kind of a charitable or a situation. And I could not make a living anymore. So I was like, uh, I know, I'll go to school. I'll, I'll go back to school and I'll become a computer animator because I had heard they made $80,000 a year, which would have been like four times more than I'd ever made in my life, you know, mm -hmm. in a year. And um, I, I went and they were like, look at that gumption. She's got gumption, you know what I mean? Uh, I, I mean, there was a wonderful man there. His name was Scott Ramon and he was just, like, I'm gonna make sure you get a scholarship. Hmm. And uh, he did. He, I, I applied for the Presidential Merit Scholarship and I got it. It was a big deal, but I didn't realize at the time my father had gotten it before me. Um, wow. He'd had it to the same school. And um, so it was a legacy kind of thing. And I and ended up, he was dead then, he was gone. But um, I ended up going and uh, be, sucking at computer animation, like really, really badly. And uh, going through that period of time where you're like, okay, I, I got here and I completely suck. 
I mean, like I just sucked. And um, I was like, what do I want to do? And, and then I thought, well, I want to write. So um, I, they didn't allow undergraduates to go into the writing program. You had to graduate and, and imply. And I just kept being this, kept pastoring them to let me take a class in the, in the master's level writing program. And they finally, just because they were like, okay, we're gonna let you take a class so that you don't come here anymore and ask. And um, so yeah. I'm like, be, be a pest. Well, was that, was this graphic novel like a part of that? Um, did that have anything to do with the class? Yeah, because what happened is when I, um, I started writing more and mm -hmm. uh, I, I, was, I was always writing since I was a kid, um, but I started writing a lot more and, um, you know, then I did my thesis as the first 24 pages of, as my, of my favorite thing is Monsters. Oh. That was my master's thesis because oh. I ended up going to the master's writing program uh, and, and taking classes. I think my first graphic piece was something called Hall of Fernie's Head, which was this big fold out. Um, I, I was in a surrealist class and uh, the Art Institute is such that you can turn in, people would turn in stuff they did on the way to school. You know what I mean? It was just not, it was very loose. So I just made this big giant comic that you fold out about, uh, it was a detective story. It was for a surrealist class. And uh, I did this detective story. And that was the first one I think I ever did in, in school, you know. I realize now that a lot of what I was doing, are you like this? I realized that I was doing comics all my life. Yeah, well, I certainly was. <laughs> I mean, that was my, my whole household was like, that's what we did, all the boys in my family. Now your brother's a comics artist as well? Yep, he's a disgraced okay. comic book artist. A no, disgraced he's, one? He's a canceled comic book artist. He's a Trump supporter, so he got canceled. Oh but he still makes comics yeah but my my dad was a big comic book reader and my brothers uh, josiah and micah were comic book uh, uh, artists are they really yeah so we just all drew comics I mean, growing up that's what we did and i have a whole folder full of uh comics that i did that my father sent me and i just keep on i hold on to them for some future exhibit or something <laughs> uh, yeah it's gonna be great yeah yeah so i think i was always a cartoonist i i never had the skill set to draw um like anatomically correct and things like that like shadows and stuff i never figured that out no um, you you i look at your work and i see plenty that is a great observational drawing it's well thank you but i, I feel like i've had to cobble together like you know um a style or something you know yeah what i, I want to know about the uh stealth drawing that your dad taught you to do would that just be like a notebook in your pocket and then go into a subway and draw people or something? Oh, yeah. Uh, he did it all the time. He did it everywhere. Was he a cartoonist? It, you would think so. I mean, his work was cartoons. Um, I don't know. I mean, I don't know what to say about his work. Hmm. It's really brilliant. Nobody knows yet, but it's brilliant. Did you save his work? Oof. I don't know where a lot of, a lot of it, I know where it is, but I don't have access to it, so. Oh, okay. What is your, what is the old country for you? Are you Italian? Well, my father's, uh, my father was from Lebanon. Oh, okay. I always thought you were Italian for some reason. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm like, um, I'm a lot of things. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Lebanese, uh, Hispanic. My mother's family is uh, maternal, uh, grandparents are Hispanic, uh, Native American, German, and Irish. Well, all right, listen, I know I've taken a lot of your time. I really appreciate that you gave me any time at all. This was No, it was wonderful. It was joyous. It was joyous. Oh.